Let me ask you this. Have you ever, have you ever preached something, say, in the book of Acts, and then when you get to Philippians five years later, you, it causes you to re-examine the interpretation you put on that when you were in Acts? Do you ever have to go yeah, back and... To, to a small degree, that is true. Um, you know, it's not that you were outright wrong. It was maybe that you made an exclusive statement that turns out not to be exclusive, or, or, or you made a, a definitive statement that maybe is not quite that definitive. You, you, you drew a principle out of there that needed to be modified a little bit. It isn't that you, you taught a doctrine in the book of Acts that gets completely overturned in Philippians. Right. So there's, <clears throat> and I think there's a, this is why seminary is, is so important, and I'm so grateful for the seminary that I went to when I went to it. Because in a three-year period in seminary, they gave me a well-thought-out, historic, theological system, a systematic theology. It was the product of understanding the Bible, but it was tried and tested. That's what seminary does for you, so that you start out with this cohesive, tested, historic... I was reading... In seminary, I was reading the Puritans. I was reading some of the Reformers. I was reading people like the Westminster Divines, as they're called. I was reading Machen and, and Warfield and hearing lectures. I heard a week's lectures from Cornelius Van Til. And uh, so I, my theology was framed up as not my own. You know, there's a new book on church planting written by a guy named Dar Darren Patrick. And it says, if you want to be an effective church planter, develop your own theology. You know, when I read that, I just almost fell off the chair. What? I mean, can you think of anything worse than to have some guy develop his own theology? This is ultimate niche marketing. You know, develop your own style, your own wardrobe, and then your own theology. So uh, seminary really helped me to, to get a theology that I could put to the test. And through the years, I will say that theology has been changed and refined and enriched, but not s severely altered, right. because it, it embraced all the things that have been passed down through the great theological struggles and through the writings and the councils and the creeds of history. So when I teach the Word of God, I'm anchored by that. So I, while I might get something wrong here or something wrong there and need to kind of fix that or correct that or clarify that, it, it never overturns everything. Right. Yeah, I occasionally hear people say, John shifted uh, <clears throat> dramatically with regard to, say, the sovereignty of God. You've become more of a Calvinist. No. And I know that's not the case because no. I've listened to those early tapes. But I think as you preach, you, you do become sometimes more definitive, more firm in a thing. You see the importance of a doctrine that you maybe right. barely touched on years ago. And so it becomes stronger and clearer and more and more well, powerful. It, it, you know this because you've gone the same journey I have. Right. The, when you first understand a doctrine, uh, it has a certain weight. But as you go year after year after year and you just keep piling on to that doctrine, passage after passage after passage, the weight of that doctrine se seriously increases. So the doctrine of divine sovereignty goes from being a new insight to all of a sudden being this overwhelmingly weighty truth that just just lands on you with such force that y you you see it everywhere and the and the richness of it the same would be true of of um, justification you and I were going through um, trying to understand the doctrine of, of imputation and I, I had said something I think it was in a Romans commentary that showed a, a, a sort of a sophomoric uh, understanding of that doctrine. You remember that. I didn't really say it the way it should have been said. I'd, I didn't have error in mind, but I didn't give, I didn't make a distinction that needed to be made between imparted righteousness and imputed righteousness. And so I was taken to the woodshed by Michael Horton, you remember. And, and it was justified at the time. And I, and I had to go back and rethink that. Well, as time has gone on, and I read every week of my life, 
and I don't know how many dozens and dudges, if not hundreds of pages every week of my life, because I can't give it out if I don't take it in. And through these years of preparation and study and passage after passage and expanding my understanding, that doctrine is clearer than it's ever been. It is weightier than it has ever been. So I think it's the combination of clarification and weightiness that is the product of the years. The doctrines haven't changed, but they're clearer now, and they, they carry so much more weight. Um, and, the, and the thing that rides along with that, and you know this as well, is the sanctifying process, which then elevates your affection for that truth. Right, yeah. So that you not only feel the weight of it and see the clarity of it, but you have this love for it, this affection for it. Right. And that shows up in, in the preaching. All those show up in the preaching of it. And just as you minister in the church, you see these trends come along, uh, like young guys devising their own theology, and you realize these doctrines that I've always preached need more emphasis because this is the answer to the problem in the evangelical world, and it, it keeps bringing you back to the gospel. I can't keep up with it, Phil. You know this. I mean, we, we get together all the time, and we say, okay, uh, I, I need to write this. I need to put this on a blog. I need to write this guy a letter. We need to do this book. We need to do this thing. Because we're always trying to correct all this stuff. Right. And, um, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm like a dinosaur in, in the new environment, the, the, the new environment of uh, entrepreneurial Christianity, um, what I call, what, what we started calling historical isolationism, where you think that it's a virtue to isolate yourself as the church that's happening now. Who wants to be a part of the church of what's happening now? I want to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. It's been happening ever since it started. I don't want a new thing. Yeah. <clears throat> people, often, people often point this out, but I think it's worth underscoring. All of your key books, all of your most important books, are in one way or another a defense of the gospel. Yeah. So all this keeps bringing you back to that point. Well, you have to get it right. Yeah. The gospel according to Jesus, uh, which really uh, all these folks wouldn't understand, was an attack on an institution in America that was viewed as above the possibility of attack for their bad theology and that started this whole thing. Um, it unmasked the no lordship issue and uh, changed the history of that institution. Hopefully, some maybe for good. The Crossway publishers wanted to bring it out again. Right. The gospel and, according and, to the apostles. The gospel according to the apostles. Shame to the gospel. How hard to believe. Um, slave. And now slave is basically one of the reviews. There were like 60 reviews on Amazon, and one of them was, "This book is a huge disappointment. It's just." MacArthur again on the lordship issue. <laughs> All right, I'm